At the end of Avatar The Last Airbender, Zuko defeats Azula in a profoundly somber showdown that demonstrates not only his final triumph over his mentally disturbed sister, but also his mature recognition of the tragedy of her story. He takes the throne, talks with Aang, his longtime enemy, and makes a speech to an assembled crowd of people from all the nations, except the Air Nation, which of course has been wiped out, and he talks about the need to restore the honor of the Fire Nation by replacing an era of war and conquest with an era of unity and peace. He also ends the show in a relationship with Mei. Now, while I do not hate this couple, it seems rather unnecessary to what the show is doing with Zuko's story, and I don't really understand why they lavished so much attention on this pairing. There's no real understanding in this relationship. They just wanted to be like it was when they were kids, and although that is perhaps understandable, they're different people now, especially in the case of Zuko. We don't see them talk about the different perspectives Zuko has gained from his travels. We don't even get to see how May reacts to seeing him for the first time in three years, perhaps for the first time since... Ozai burned his face and exiled him. No, rather the first time we see them at the start of Season 3, they're back together, and they're once more defined by their lack of communication. Zuko apologizes for not telling Mei everything, and I believe he's sincere and it's sweet, but that does not fix the underlying issues. He left without telling her just because he did not believe she would understand. He believed she would try to persuade him to stay. And this is never acknowledged, and this dynamic never really changes. Even though she forgives him, she never shows any real understanding for why he made the choices he did. As a sweeping romantic tale, I'm just not particularly convinced. While I love Avatar The Last Airbender and consider it one of the great television shows of the 2000s, animated or otherwise, it takes a bizarre tack to romantic relationships, not knowing how to elevate them beyond the cliched trappings of C-tier romantic comedies. Compared to the pathos and nuance it demonstrates when dealing with other relationships, this failing is particularly egregious. It's no surprise, then, that one of the show's most popular romantic pairings is not one that the show's creators intended to be romantic. Enter Katara. A few years younger than Zuko, she is distraught at the loss of her mother, who died in order to protect her. Her father leaves to fight in the war. Physically, her and her brother are fine, they have the entire village to help them, especially their grandmother. But psychologically, it is a much different story. Sokka hardly has any memories of his mother. He cannot remember her face. For Katara, her mother is all she can think of. She can't stop reliving that day. She can't stop from being consumed by that grief. A big reason for this is because she was there and Sokka wasn't. It's also partly because she cares more about her ties to her tribe and her culture than Sokka, who valorizes science and technology. And it's also partly because they're just very different people. People handle grief differently. It's not that Sokka doesn't care, or even that he's able to transcend easily what happened to him, like Aang can. But Sokka has an easygoing attitude, unlike the somber, passionate temperament of Katara. 
to phrase this lightly, she does not like Zuko when they first meet. Why should she? Zuko chases Aang all over the world, trying to capture the Avatar out of a misguided belief that if he can take the Avatar to the Fire Nation, his father will give him back the honor that he lost when he was exiled. During Zuko's first direct interaction with Katara in episode 109, he taunts her with her mother's necklace, while trying to coerce her into revealing Aang's location. It's not exactly a meet-cute. He becomes the face of the Fire Nation for her. One of Avatar's smartest insights about war is how inhuman it is. To quote what Simone Vale said about that great war poem, The Iliad, Force turns people into objects. The Fire Lord, when Aang fights him at the end, is actually not that hard to defeat, demonstrating that this really isn't about him as a person. Though he is terrible, he is not the one who started the war. The systems that initiated the war long precede him. Giving war a human face makes it easier to comprehend, but as Katara realizes as she's talking to Zuko in the catacombs beneath Ba Sing Se, this is a fallacy. Zuko is not evil incarnate, he's a confused, awkward teenager, struggling to balance the ideology he unknowingly inherited and bought into as a child with the actual lived-in experience of traveling throughout the Earth Kingdom and seeing all the devastation the Fire Nation has caused. Season 1 Zuko would have mocked the anger Katara displays when they're in prison together, but Season 2 Zuko understands that anger all too well. He makes the brave decision to reveal the truth about himself, something he could not do for Song in episode 202 and Jin in episode 215. Something that resulted in his being banished from a town he helped in episode 207, Zuko alone. After spending three years chasing the Avatar, here he is, pouring out his soul to the person who's closest to the Avatar. Only once previously have we seen him discuss his past, and this was during a monologue he gave in episode 120, The Siege of the North, Part 2, when he knows Aang cannot hear him because Aang is in the spirit world. Even when Zuko is with his uncle, he is rather reserved, preferring to focus on his future rather than his past. His revealing all this to Katara is an unexpected act of bravery. And it pays off. In the most unlikely person, he finds someone who understands him. When he joins Team Avatar, he becomes the other adult in the group. Finally, Katara does not have to carry that burden alone. It's Zuko who shouts at Sokka to get out of Appa's mouth when they're trying to consider something serious. It's Zuko who assigns Aang homework and grabs him by his robes when he tries to sneak out of firebending practice. Zuko and Katara work together, as demonstrated when they take down Azula, or even before that, when they're searching for Aang. When Zuko has the opportunity to choose any member of Team Avatar to accompany him in his final fight, he chooses Katara. Aside from his uncle, there is no one he trusts more than Katara, not even Aang. Now, none of this would make the relationship between them satisfying if the rapport between them wasn't electric, but it is. There is a difference between a pairing that's only abstractly interesting and one that is viscerally compelling. I love how Katara gently teases him about the actor playing him in the Ember Island Players while also expressing real heartfelt concern when actor Zuko betrays his uncle. These are actual adult interactions, as opposed to her interactions with Aang in the same episode. Aang is so obsessed with the thought that Katara might not love him romantically, just because the play Katara is with the play Zuko. Aang outright says that he would be in the Avatar state 
where his chakra is not blocked. This just because the play did not put him together with Katara. And when he asks Katara about the relationship and she says that she's confused, he tries to kiss her. The relationship between Katara and Zuko is made possible only by Zuko's growth. Both the internal change he has undergone and his ability to demonstrate that change externally by revealing the truth about himself to Katara. And it's Katara who understands what he's gone through and the person he is trying to become. When he is with Katara, he does not have to pretend. They don't have to worry that the other person won't understand them. Compare the interactions between them to the interactions between Zuko and Mei. Yes, there is love beneath the apathetic facade of the Mako pairing, but there is also anxiety and uncertainty. When Zuko is with Katara, he's a better and more complete person, not because she's so different than him, but because they are similar. And she pushes him to carry through on the promise he showed when he was pouring himself out to her in Season 2. So thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like and comment and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can and you want to see more videos like this. Keep watching Avatar The Last Airbender. It's a brilliant, empathetic, thoughtful show that is finally getting the attention it deserves. And I'm glad about that. It's a show that really asks what redemption and change really mean, and there are no easy answers. Anyway, tune in soon for my next analysis. It will be coming soon. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.